Hi everyone, my name's Jane Ryan from the Victorian Murray Floodplain Restoration Project and I'm your host for today's technical presentation series, introducing the speakers as we go through the different disciplines and identifying ways that we'll be connecting to people's questions about this work. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Murray River floodplains and pay my respects for the elders to the elders past and present. I recognise their enduring and ongoing relationship and the importance of their care for cu culture on this country. I myself am coming to you on the country of the First Peoples of the Milo and Mallee, and I pay respects to their elders in particular. This is, the, this is our series of technical presentations that will delve into the studies that are being undertaken as part of the environmental effects statements. This is the last in our series. You may be interested in some of the other topics that have already been uploaded to our website, and there are other also opportunities for you to ask any questions of our specialists about their work or the project in general. In this session, you'll have the opportunity to hear from the project, project about the overall process that's currently being overtake, undertaken, and then from the specialists themselves who have responsibilities for technical leads in land use, community and business. But firstly, in case you were wondering why we need to do this project in the first place, since the start of the last century, the river system and its floodplains have been altered to supply water to regional communities for drinking water, irrigation water, and to manage flood risk. This has meant the aquatic life on the floodplain has had changed watering patterns, and many parts of the floodplain have been disconnected from the river. While parts of the floodplain still get a drink, as you can see in this cross section, there are important flood de dependent plants that live in the middle and edges of the floodplain that are currently being, aren't currently being inundated. Our project aims to provide parts of the flooding patterns that they need to survive and thrive. We've committed to these nine ecologically significant places, but to be clear, there will be benefits across the landscape in between these specific sites as we target the delivery of environmental water into the Murray floodplain. So how do we know it will work? Well, we've been watering floodplains with pumps and regulators since the millennium drought. These photos at Hadda from Parks Victoria show the condition of the trees and the change in uh, the condition and understory can be remarkable. As you can see, while this process of developing these projects has been a long one, we're currently in the regulatory approvals phase, which will also be ongoing into next year. So we'll begin this presentation by passing over to James David from the project team to talk more specifically about what this entails. Thanks, Jane. So Jane's spoken about some of the background. My role here today is to talk through the approvals process and what we need to go through the processes around the approvals in order to deliver these projects. All nine projects are subject to comprehensive environmental assessments and approvals processes. And through these processes, we identify and assess not only the potential impacts of the projects, but also the anticipated benefits that these projects will deliver. Through the assessments, we'll identify the impacts that can be avoided and minimised and drive these projects, drive the designs of these projects and the construction methods accordingly. The assessments will take the form of two environment effects statements and two environment reports. The first AES looks at Lindsay and Walpola, second AES, Hatter Lakes North and Belsey and Gara, with the two ARs looking, sorry, the two ERs looking at Nia, Vanifera and Barra and the other one, Dunbar, Guthrum and Benwell. Each of these studies comprise a number of specialist studies, all of which are addressing matters set out in the scoping requirements, which have been published on the DELT website by the Minister for Planning, and any other matters identified as relevant throughout the course of the assessments. They cover a diverse range of topics, and there are some differences in what the EASs and the ERs are being asked to cover. These topics ultimately allow for an integrated assessment of the potential impacts and benefits of each project against the project objectives and the evaluation objectives set out in those scoping requirements. Each study typically has their own methodology relevant to the discipline and the matters being assessed, but generally each comprises desktop assessment, 
review of existing information, databases, reports, maps, field investigations to collect new or updated information that add to or reconfirm the vast amounts of existing information that we have about these areas. In a couple of cases, not all, some modelling is required, and there's a lot of consultation going on with those who know the land best, traditional owners, Parks Victoria, catchment management authorities, to name a few. Not only that, and we'll touch on this a bit later as well, but community groups and businesses have been consulted and, and that continues through this process and into, uh, into delivery as well. And where some further baseline monitoring has been required, that's been undertaken as part of the field investigations. So here's a bit of a mud map of the process. We're down the left hand side uh, at the moment preparing the EES and the ER documentation. The purpose of these, as I said before, is to provide an integrated assessment, but really to ensure that the statutory approval decisions on whether or not to approve the projects in due course are based on full understanding of that assessment, full understanding of the potential benefits and effects of the projects, ensuring that decision makers are fully aware of the implications of their decision. Hence the process that we have to go through following the, uh, the preparation of the documentation. Critically, this includes public exhibition where all documentation will be publicly exhibited and the community and stakeholders will be invited to make a submission on the assessments or the approvals documentation or any other aspect of the project. And depending on which process, be it AES or AR, we either have public hearings, public inquiries or a submitters forum. But during that phase, regardless of the process, an independent panel will be appointed by the Minister for Planning to consider our assessments, the mitigation measures we've proposed and any of the submissions that we've received. They'll put their recommendations to the Minister for Planning, who'll then make recommendations to the decision makers. We need a number of approvals in hand before we can start work. I don't pretend we've got them all on this slide here, um, but there are a couple of them in particular to touch on in a moment some before works, some during works. During uh, the exhibition, as I said, everything will be documented, everything will be exhibited, all of the information necessary to inform those statutory decisions. Two of the key approvals that are needed before construction, and again, not the only two, but just to draw your attention to the planning scheme amendment under the Planning and Environment Act, what we're seeking to do here is to ask the Minister for Planning to amend the relevant pro, uh, to amend the relevant planning schemes to consolidate the requirements that would ordinarily apply, such as a multitude of planning permits, with a view to streamlining the approvals required under the Planning and Environment Act. That's done through what's called an incorporated document that includes conditions that we'll have to meet. The planning scheme amendment document, including that incorporated document, will be exhibited with the EESs and the ERs and communities will have the opportunity to have their say on that. If approved, that will ultimately help us deliver the projects more efficiently while still maintaining an appropriate level of rigour under the Act. And everyone's submission, be it from businesses or interest groups or individuals, will be considered by the relevant inquiry and, and will really help inform the statutory decision making process. Thank you. Now, now to our technical experts. Firstly, we'll now hear from Paul Dello, our agricultural technical lead, about the importance of parts of the agriculture of agriculture consistent with the EES scoping documents. And he'll talk about the focus of the assessment and the key issues he's investigating. Thanks, Jane. I'm Paul Dello, and I'm going to today provide an outline of the assessment of agricultural effects on agricultural production and farming operations for the EES West and EES Central projects only. And in particular, we'll reference the Mildura and the Swan Hill LGAs where these projects are located. So the purpose of our agricultural assessment is to assess effects on agricultural production and farming operations from construction, commissioning and operation of the projects, and to propose mitigation measures to avoid or minimise effects on agricultural productivity and farming operations. So to assess the likely effects on agricultural production and farming operations arising from the EES projects, we applied the following methodology. We looked at the existing environment with respect to agricultural production and farming operations. 
We identified what the agricultural land uses and areas affected were to estimate the productivity effect on agricultural production and farming operations. We then assessed the likely effects, that was the impacts and the benefits at the various stages of project development. We also consulted with stakeholders to inform the development of the project and understand potential effects. This agricultural assessment included in interviews with agricultural industry bodies, government agencies and private landholders. And some of these industries and stakeholders will be shown later on in other presentations. We also identified key risk and mitigation measures, and then we identified environmental delivery standards to mitigate effects based on the findings of this assessment. So then onto the next slide, we looked at the, um, looked at the existing environment for agriculture across, across the area. So the history of agricultural enterprises within the regional study area is very typical of the development in agriculture that has occurred in many parts of Australia. The land is largely being cleared or modified for agricultural development. However, large areas of native vegetation have remained in national parks, reserves, traveling stock routes and state forest. These public lands are important as they support the apiary industry by providing important seasonal floral resources for beekeepers and pollination services for adjacent agricultural industries. These floral resources and a healthy Murray River system have been crucial to the evolution of agriculture within the area. Land use across the Mildura and Swan Hill region is diverse, and the region is an important centre for Northwest Victoria, South Australia and New South Wales. And you can see some of the key stats, agricultural statistics in the area. And when we look at the next slide, we look at the, the uh, gross value of agricultural production generated in Victoria for the Swan Hill and the Mildura local government areas. In 2016, more than $931 million was produced from agricultural production in Swan Hill which represented 7% of the state's total. While Mildura LGA accounted for 577 million and was the fifth largest agricultural region within Victoria. Almond production, grape and broadacre cropping contributes to the majority of the value, with grapes and other fruits, particularly stone fruits and citrus fruits, also significant. Generally, the typical farm unit in the regional study area are mixed farming enterprises that run livestock and cropping enterprises on the same farm. The agricultural industry is also the largest sector of employment in both Mildura and Swan Hill. As we look at the next slide, Mildura and Swan Hill both have a semi-arid climate with mean average annual rainfall, and therefore the agricultural industries have relied on irrigation entitlements from the Murray River, with over 50% of the land use within these two LGAs associated with agricultural activity. These two maps on the screen provide an overview of the existing land use associated with the projects and detail the factors that influence the selection and operation of agricultural enterprises across the region. The blue areas on both the maps show the maximum inundation area for the two sites, while the orange shaded area on the map on the left particularly shows the irrigated horticultural production, while the dark green area in the right hand side map is associated with National Park, while the aqua, light aqua colour represents mixed farming enterprises, and you can see some of those areas intersected by the maximum inundation area there. Agriculture only accounts for a small percentage of the total land use within the study area for these two sites you can see on the screen. For Belsa Younger on the left, it represents 14% of agricultural land, while Hatter Lakes on the right is approximately 12% of agricultural land is intersected by the project. On the next slide, we look at um, existing agricultural production within the project area is generally not irrigated and therefore unsuitable for horticultural production. While dry land production is limited by soil, rainfall, topography, remnant vegetation and access challenges. General cropping land in this area is likely to support only intermittent or opportunistic cropping in years when rainfall is sufficient. These slides also show some of the irrigated horticultural activities such as almond orchards that are located adjacent to the project sites and not affected by the operations. And while a number of these activities rely on access to irrigation infrastructure, which is located along the Murray River, and you can see the photo in the middle of a typical irrigation pumping site along the Murray River. We then looked at some of, uh, some of the initial observations from the construction phase of the project. So we looked at how construction activities could result in the temporary or permanent changes in land use or reduce capacity to use land for the duration of the construction as a result of activities such as site establishment, access tracks or borrow sites. 
We also looked at biosecurity, which is a term that is commonly used for the management and the set of measures adopted to protect a property from the entry and spread of pests, diseases and weeds. Construction activities could result in the introduction or spread of weeds, pests and diseases as a result of the movement of people, vehicles and machinery, resulting in elevated biosecurity risk and potential increased production costs. And these would need to be managed in accordance with the Catchment and Lands Protection Act. We also looked how construction activities could result in direct effects on land capability and farm infrastructure, which unless mitigated, would temporarily reduce the productive potential of agricultural land and associated operations. Construction traffic, dust deposition, bushfire, and some other effects which could impact on farming operations will be outlined today and in other technical presentations. The construction phase would also result in some beneficial effects, such as the upgrade and or construction of um, tracks, which would be used by agricultural landholders for their farming operations into the future. And while the excavation of borrow sites would result in the excavation of land that could be repurposed by the landholder as a dam or used for stock watering purposes. Then we looked at some of the some of the initial observations during the operational stage. We looked at um, how agricultural landholders could temporarily lose access to land and key, key farm infrastructure, which is not directly required for operations, but this could result in additional time and cost when undertaking routine agricultural operations, such as accessing river pumps or managing routine uh, livestock activities. We also looked at how um, operation activities could result in the introduction of spread of weeds, pests or diseases, which would result in elevated biosecurity risk and potential increased production costs. We then also looked at um, other operation activities that could result in a change in agricultural production effects. And these were related to the timing, uh, volume, duration, and preferred frequency of those temporary managed inundation events uh, and the flows which would occur as, as a result of those environmental flows. But it also had some beneficial effects. So agricultural production within the project area is generally limited to occasional or opportunistic livestock grazing during and then during operation activities, this increase in the frequency and extent of these managed inundation events is expected to provide a marginal increase in the overall feed production for grazing of livestock. Managed inundation events would also have beneficial effects for both the APRIS, who rely on access to public lands, and also the adjacent agricultural industries, which are dependent on honeybee pollination for most of their production. That covers our agricultural assessment today. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So adding to the presentation, we'll now hear from Stephen Dahl to give us um, some insight into our next area of assessment, that is bushfire. Hello, everybody. It's Steve Dahl. I'll talk to you today about the bushfire assessments that are being undertaken for the VMRP projects. Just to touch on the scoping requirements that James talked to earlier. Um, broadly, our scope looks to, to look at safety hazards um, to the public arising from the project construction and operation, to describe and to evaluate the bushfire hazard in the project area and the broader landscape and what that means for people, property and infrastructure, and to assess the potential cum cumulative effects on biodiversity and or heritage values. In terms of the method that we've applied to this assessment or to these assessments, I'll start off by looking at the existing conditions. And the first of those is to look at existing procedures and processes and measures that are in place to mitigate and, and manage bushfire. So that includes measures that are implemented by a range of different government agencies, um, the CFA and private landholders. We've also looked at landscape and site conditions. So things like land use, vegetation types, distribution, uh, assets and a range of other things that may influence um, bushfire hazard or behaviour. We've looked at uh, bushfire history, so we've looked at where ignitions have occurred and the type of nature of those ignitions and where fires have spread to within the landscape. And that's been supported by a series of site inspections as well. The second part of the assessment method was to look at the existing experience that we've got with uh, environmental watering projects. So we've done a series of literature reviews and we've talked to land managers and fire agencies on their observations and experiences um, following the uh, 
in use of environmental water, and that's included um, some case studies. Once we've done that, we've then looked at the construction and operation effects of the projects and particularly looked at the potential for fire ignition or fire spread onto or off the sites as a result of construction or operational activities and also considered the beneficial effects. And for those effects that we consider to be potentially adverse, we've looked at risk and imp impact mitigation measures. In terms of existing conditions, the most obvious and obviously most important one uh, is around vegetation. The floodplain areas are generally quite variable and um, so the vegetation um, is also quite variable in terms of um, its location, it's, it's the type of vegetation, uh, the frequency of its inundation, the history of land use and um, grazing by nature, native and introduced species also plays a role in that vegetation. And that variability also affects the fuel types that are present on those sites. So I guess we're interested in the types of fuels, their flammability, their location and their connectivity, either vertically, so within um, within a particular location, the ability to promote crown fires, for example, or horizontally in terms of the ability to, to allow a fire to spread. And the sorts of fuels that we're interested in are mainly the fine fuels. So they're fuels up to about six millimetres in diameter, which affect the rate of spread and flame height of a fire. Our next slide, we'll look at the bushfire history. So here's an example of the Belsi Yungera uh, site. Bushfires and floodplains uh, tend to be most commonly ignited by uh, unattended campfires or by lightning. Uh, Bushfires and floodplains generally tend to be small um, due to the types of fuels, the arrangement of those fuels, um, the low to moderate spotting potential of the vegetation and the trees, uh, the presence of water and the accessibility of these sites in terms of the, the ability to respond and suppress them fairly quickly. Bushfires outside the project area in some of the larger Mallee areas to the west and the western sites um, may be larger as a result of the valley of vegetation being uh, having more continuous and, and larger and um, having a greater continuity of fuels, particularly after the wet seasons when you may generate uh, additional grass growth. Another important factor from a landscape perspective is the adjoining land uses and a number of the sites are adjoined by uh, irrigated land uses, which limit the potential for landscape scale fires. Turning to the next slide. In terms of some of the effects that we've looked at from a construction point of view, um, hot work and the use of machinery uh, introduces a potential additional source of ignition, storage of fuels, and that might either be liquid fuels for plant and equipment or uh, the temporary salvage and storage of vegetation for reuse uh, um, post project um, introduces additional fuel. These risks can generally be managed by standard controls uh, on construction activities. So that can be related to training uh, or equipment. It can be related to controls on site access or equipment use in certain periods of, of fire danger. And or it could be uh, monitoring procedures for management of flammable or hazardous materials. In terms of the next slide, operation. It's probably where um, it does become interesting. We are obviously looking to stimulate vegetation. So we're looking to apply water and, um, and stimulate vegetation. And the vegetation response, uh, as, as because it varies across the landscape, will also uh, vary. So things like the vegetation type, its current condition, uh, the climate experience at the time, and things like germination and grazing may also determine how vegetation uh, responds to the watering. Uh, literature also shows that uh, lithophores uh, will also either decompose in the presence of water or be relocated moving water. So there's a range of factors that may increase or, or alter um, the fuels or decrease the fuels present um, in a particular location. Generally more water more often would promote uh, more flood dependent vegetation which has uh, a lower flammability but there are also areas that have a grass grassy understory and in these locations we would expect to uh, have an increase in, in fine fuels for the summer that follows uh, the inundation period. So that's a short term and a, a response and is limited to the inundation area. There's some examples here of some of the monitoring 
that has done, as well as some photos that are from existing condition monitoring. Other aspects of the operation that we've considered uh, is the, the current measures that are in place and whether they need to amend or the, I guess the impacts of the, of the project on those current measures. Uh, the potential access restrictions that come from temporary inundation events. These would generally happen in spring, but may extend into summer. So bushfire um, suppression response from um, road access is a consideration. Fuel treatments. So in some areas, roads uh, sides are slashed and mulched to maintain uh, a fire break. Uh, if that occurs in inundation areas, these areas may regenerate more quickly and need to be treated more frequently. And in terms of assets, the majority of our uh, built assets, given that these are, are generally public lands and uh, also flood prone land, the majority of assets in, that are built assets within the park, other than um, park management assets, relate to water supply uh, or power um, assets. Slide. Number of benefits associated with uh, the environmental water from a bushfire perspective um, the increased frequency and extent of water and the existing or increasing the green hydrated vegetation is expected to reduce the likelihood of ignition and the rate and extent of spread of bushfire. As we've touched on before, the uh, recruitment of water dependent species uh, is likely to encourage uh, less fire prone, prone species in many areas. And in the long term and in the short term, um, the improvement in the health of the vegetation improves its resilience bushfire via a number of means, um, its carbohydrate reserves, but also the presence of seed and the seed reserve within the soil or the canopy of the tree. Thank you, that concludes my talk. Thanks, Steve. We now have Reese Armstrong to talk to us about land use planning. Thanks, Reese. Thank you, Jane, for that introduction. Um, my name is Rhys Armstrong and I'm going to presenting, be presenting to you on aspects relating to land use planning. So our land use assessment broadly considers the likely effects of the project on existing and future land use from both a construction and operational perspective and these form an important part of the EES. So our scope and requirements have a principal evaluation objective, which asks us to, to look at how uh, the project can minimise potential adverse social, economic, community and land use effects, including impacts on existing infrastructure and open space. And specifically in relation to land use, we're required to evaluate and describe the existing environment and we'll then look at the positive adverse effects of um, on land use, the extended duration of temporary dis disruptions and indirect benefits and cumulative impacts, look at what mitigation measures are available and what approaches are available to monitoring effects and applying contingency measures. So similar to the other presentations which you've uh, seen today, we have a structured way of going through this, first a risk assessment, uh, then looking at existing conditions, reviewing the planning policy and controls, existing and planned land uses and obtaining feedback. We look at the uh, likely effects, both beneficial and adverse, and we also factor in uh, the outcomes of other specialist assessments before looking at mitigation of adverse effects, monitoring and performance measures. This is an example of um, the zoning pattern that applies to Belsa Yangera. So this forms, along with Hadda Lakes North, forms part of EES Central. And um, you'll see from this plan, from this map, the bulk of our project area is within uh, public land ownership. So most of it is zoned public conservation and recreation zone, with some adjacent land within the farming zone and some uh, major roads which are zone RDZ1. We also then have to factor in the planning overlays that represent a lot of the environmental uh, assets that are associated with the project area, land subject to inundation, um, vegetation protection overlays, environmental significance overlays and bush management, bushfire management. This map um, gives you uh, a good indication of the distribution of land use. So uh, the, the, the green, the darker green, is all the land that's in public uh, land management. And then you'll see the um, hatch land, which is uh, private land, which was subject to a number of um, 
Section 173 agreements. And also we have uh, land which is um, in conservation covenant as well, plus the balance of the land, which is, as Paul Dello mentioned previously, used for opportunistic grazing or other farming operations. And we also look at land use constraints. So there are a number of environmental constraints on the use and development of land. A number of landowners have entered into covenants, particularly restrictive covenants, which recognise the conservation values that are associated with that privately owned land. And there are agreements that allow those conservation values to be protected while the land is used um, for other activities. And also there are uh, constraints which relate to um, quality of vegetation. So those uh, relate back to the VPO and the ESO constraints, which I described previously. So this is uh, a similar situation for the Hadda Lake North area. Same general principles apply within the project area. The bulk of the uh, land is in public ownership and within the PCRZ. And again, we have the same sort of suite of uh, overlays that apply. Uh, in relation to Hadda Lakes, we also have a small area which is included within a heritage overlay, but the balance are typically the same uh, land subject to inundation, environmental significance and bushfire management overlays. And in terms of land use, you'll see that the, the darker green area again is the land which is in uh, public land management. We have some area, area of land which is to the east of the project area, which is virtually entirely surrounded by um, public land, which is uh, used for farming purposes, and then land further to the north, which um, is um, used for more intensive farming purposes. The, the yellow circles indicate the location and buffer areas around a number of apari sites, which um, are generally located within uh, public conservation land. And again, within the header area, we also have um, examples where land is, is held by a way of covenant to protect environmental values. So what benefits and effects have we identified so far? So through the construction phase, we'll have benefits in terms of upgraded uh, tracks, which improve accessibility. Uh, we have the undergrounding of a pipeline for irrigation purposes to Lake Powell and the in, in ability to uh, retain existing irrigation infrastructure. The effects during this phase we've generally identified as temporarily limiting or limiting access and uh, use of public and private land associated with construction activity. Uh, we will have some permanent occupations which are generally limited to public land in areas of non-productive private land. And we will have some issues associated with land use immunity, generally minor impacts associated with noise, dust and visual impact, some of which will be discussed by Laura, I think, in the next presentation. During the, uh, the actual operational phase where uh, there will be um, managed inundation of land, we see uh, a number of beneficial outcomes which all which align with the, um, the the planning policy framework within the Victorian planning provisions and also with a range of other uh, catchment management plans and strategies. So we have a good close alignment with policy planning controls and the title covenants and restrictions which currently apply. There's good alignment with the community expectations regarding the protection of the Murray River corridor. Uh, it enhances sustainable land practices and gives benefits in terms of climate change resilience, um, pasture management and water-based recreation. The operational phase does generate public land and private land constraints because of the nature of the uh, frequency and duration of the um, inundation. However, in terms of amenity, there are potentially minor uh, effects associated again with noise, dust and visual amenity, primarily during uh, maintenance activities. And then the scope of the impacts that we have identified to date. Thank you. Thanks, Rhys. So building on this work, we now have Laura um, Farrell to talk about landscape and visual impact assessment. Thanks, Laura. How are you? Thank you. Um, so my name is Laura Farrell and as said, I'll be talking about um, la issues around landscape and visual impact assessment today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what is landscape and visual impact assessment? The landscape and visual assessment 
identifies the existing environment and is, a, is an assessment of the landscape effects and the visual effects of the project. And I'll get in and have a little bit of a description of both of those in a few minutes. For our methodology and our approach to this assessment, we use um, an international methodology, um, but we supplement this with a number of different guidance that have been provided around um, Australia to, look to, to provide a bespoke approach to um, what we're doing. So generally our assessment follows this, the same themes as a lot of the other technical assessments that are done where we have scoping requirements. We have a, a, a project description with a lot of photos in there of the different types of things that are happening. We identify our study area. We look at the leg legislative context within the surrounding area, looking at views and, and, and landscapes and different types of protections that are there. And then we assess, we identify what is the existing landscape condition and the existing visual condition, and then do an assessment on those and, and provide through that overall assessment um, environmental delivery standards at the end of the project. Next slide, please. So what is the landscape effect versus the visual effect? And I think that's a really important basis to start with. An assessment of landscape effect deals with the effects of change and development on landscape as a resource in its own right. Whereas an assessment of visual effects deals with the effects and um, the effects of change and development on views available to people and visual and their visual amenity. So one is looking at landscape in its own right, and the other looks at people and, and what they're the views that they're experiencing. So when we talk about landscape, I think this is a really good, um, this circle is a really good um, overall kind of what do we mean by landscapes? So we're talking about people and places. So if we look at the top half of the circle, it's around what's underground, what's on the ground. So we're talking about geology, landform, vegetation. And then we start to look at how people have interacted with, with that landscape over time. So how people have, you know, enclosed the land, how people have developed the land. And then the bottom half of the circle, this is where we get into the aesthetic and perceptual. So how people experience the landscape and things like how we're um, looking at the, uh, when we're on site, the things that we're experiencing, the things that we're hearing, smelling, looking and seeing and how we're feeling. We bring all of these aspects together to provide a good example of what a landscape is. Next slide. So throughout the nine sites and four studies that we've done, we've we there are a lot of different types of characters, a lot of different types of sensitivities, but generally we've come across three predominant landscape characters that are common to a lot of the sites. This is the Murray River riparian corridor, the woodland and forested areas, and the rural living and farming areas. And you can see from the photos, while they're similar characters when you move through the site you've definitely different experiences of the Murray River you know when you look at the western portions versus you look at the eastern portions and each of the study de studies delve into these kind of nuances of what that character is within that study area. Next slide please. So when we talk about landscape effects we talk about the landscape sensitivity to change and then the magnitude of change that that will happen on that landscape. So um, Things, general observations and our initial findings through um, these study areas across all of the sites have been that during construction, um, the landscapes, you know, there'll be a minor increase in traffic, um, construction machinery, personnel, removal of vegetation, minor earthworks within the construction footprint, and the establishment of lay down areas, stockpile areas, um, and construction machinery. And then moving into the operational um, effects, there'll be um, the introduction of infrastructure um, within, you know, localized areas within some of these highly um, valued landscapes. But we also are looking at um, long term, what are the potential beneficial aspects of the project? So looking at how the managed inundation will improve, um, improve uh, the health of the vegetation and encourage new growth. So from a visual perspective, how that will change as well over time. Next slide, please. So when we talk and then moving on now to talk about more the visual side of things. So um, part of what we do is we identify who are the people experiencing this landscape. So we've got park users, campers, residential receptors, so people who live in the nearby um, locations and, and road users and different types of road users. 
Um, we also look at the key visual features within the areas, so the Murray River and its associated waterways, wildlife reserves, national parks, state forests, and the rural townships in the area. Um, and again, there's lots of different kind of landscapes and people, how they use them. Um, and within these sensitive receptors, we also kind of classify and identify what are their sensitivities. So obviously, um, people who are there longer, um, who might live nearby, would have higher sensitivities, whereas people traveling along a highway or along a main road um, at speed would have lower sensitivities. So visual effects, we've got the visual receptors, as I said, we identify what their sensitivity would be. So whether they have a higher sensitivity to change or a lower sensitivity to change. And then we identify what the magnitude of change would be. So what's the change that they're going to experience? And those together help us identify what that visual effect would be. So during construction, things that we're, we would, we're, um, finding throughout all of these study areas is that there will be um, alteration, some minor alteration to some views with the increase in traffic and construction machinery again and construction personnel. The um, uh, you know activities within um, where, where parts of the park are remaining open, so um, upgrading to tracks and um, putting in infrastructure and looking at the construction footprint as well and, and the removal of some vegetation. And then for the operational effects, um, so we're, we've got things like the introduction and localised areas of, of containment banks, regulators, drop structures and pump stations. Um, and then also looking at that, those, those containment banks, which are along some of the existing road network as well. Um, again, we're we're looking at long term. What will be the from a visual perspective, the visual uh, the the visual benefits of some of this. So, looking at how the managed inundation would um, in, improve the existing vegetation and new growth. So, looking at kind of those areas as they are now, and then looking at the inundation areas of, of what they might be from a visual perspective going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. We'll now hear from Owen Bushell, who's here to talk to us about social and business. Thanks, Owen. Uh, thanks, Jane. So yes, my name's Owen Bushell, and I'm uh, talking about the social and business assessment. So in my presentation today, I'm going to cover four things. First, what's it all about? Two, who we're talking to? Three, some of the existing conditions. And then four, some of our initial observations. So first, What's it all about? So really the, the scope of the social and business assessments is to understand what the project means for the community. So the question we're asking ourselves is, does the project minimize potential adverse social and economic effects, including impacts on existing infrastructure and open space? So this means that we're looking at both uh, positive and negative effects, including uh, those on business. So the potential for displacement or acquisition uh, changes to business operations. Uh, looking at public open space or recreational facilities and uh, the implications for users of these facilities and open space or changes to access or amenity. And finally, we're looking at social and cultural values. So the potential for changes to community education or religious facilities uh, due to displacement or altered access or amenity. So who are we speaking to? Community and stakeholder engagement is a really important input to the social and business assessment, and we're speaking to quite a broad range of uh, stakeholders. And what we have in the slide here is just a snapshot of a couple that we're speaking to. It's, it's also important to note that um, uh, traditional owners and interested parties are a very important stakeholder for the uh, project, but are being um, uh, engaged with as part of a separate process. But when it comes to the social and business assessment, uh, we're working with some of the, we're engaging with some of the partner agencies, so Parks Victoria and the CMAs. Um, also uh, consulting with local government and state agencies such as the Victorian Fisheries Authority, Sport and Recreation Victoria, Agriculture Victoria. And they're all providing very valuable insights as to you know, what's happening in these parks and the implications for you know, the community and businesses. Importantly, we're also speaking with uh, landholders in the project area to understand what the project means for them and uh, how they're using their properties. Speaking with business associations as well uh, to understand not just the, the direct but also the indirect implications of the projects. 
and clubs and peak bodies. There's a range of uh, different groups who can talk to what is happening in these uh, parks and the uh, very important sources of information. So organisations like Bushwalking Victoria, Murray Regional Tourism, Paddle Victoria, etc. So that's just a snapshot of a number of the stakeholders that we're speaking to uh, across the projects. So I'm now just going to talk about existing conditions. So it's mostly Crown land, national parks and state forest. Um, importantly for the social and business assessment, um, the users of the parks do vary. So you've got people living locally who use a park at a different frequency and uh, the parks are a different frequency and for different activities. But then you've got people from the broader region and interstate who often have a different uh, pattern of access and use and different activities. And also really important for the assessments is understanding that the visitor numbers do vary by park. There are some that are uh, quite popular in terms of Gumbauer or Hadda and others that have a lower level of visitation, uh, say Lindsay Island and, and so forth. In terms of uh, some of the key activities uh, that we've identified, so you have uh, fishing, camping, canoeing, bushwalking, uh, bird watching and four wheel driving. And it's important to note that there's also uh, a range of uh, facilities in the park, so campgrounds, tracks and paths, uh, which visitors are all using. So I'm going to move, uh, sorry, just moving on some of the business existing conditions. As discussed previously, there are a range of apiary sites used by commercial beekeeping companies in the parks, um, but there's also tourism businesses operating within the parks or reliant on activities that are occurring within the parks. Uh, we have forestry in, in, in Guthrum Benwell, and unsurprisingly for the, the broader study area, uh, the largest industry of employment is agriculture, forestry and fishing. And it's important to note for the social and business uh, assessment that the region does continue to grow uh, economically, as a number of the other presenters have touched on here. So just some initial observations. And first, I'm going to talk about construction. And it's important when we talk about this to note that construction is a reasonably short period of time. So firstly, uh, from a social perspective, some of the things that we're looking at is really around the change in uh, changes in access to or inundation of recreational sites and looking at what that means for visitors. Uh, do it, does it make it harder to access some of these sites or some of these sites do become, uh, would become inaccessible? And these are the kind of things that we're looking at. From a, a business assessment point of view, we're looking at uh, the increased investment and what that translates to in terms of jobs and consumption in the region. And also some of the trans transport related business effects, including potential upgrades of specific local roads or uh, delays or, or detours related to construction tra uh, transport. Importantly, also looking at tourism related businesses and uh, whether they'd see a reduction, a temporary reduction in visitors during the construction period uh, in these parks. And then uh, also looking at effects on APRIS and other farming businesses, uh, particularly in relation to uh, effects around access and operation. So that's construction, but now moving on to operation and operational uh, operational changes. These are the ones that are going to last uh, for the duration of the of, of the project. And it's really important to note from a, uh, the uh, social perspective, uh, many of the visitors are drawn to these parks by their ecological values. You know, it, these provide the setting in which people can camp, they can uh, kayak, they can walk, they can four wheel drive and so forth. And improved ecological values could enhance these places for park visitors and improve the setting in which they're undertaking these recreational activities and be of great value to them and to future users. It's also uh, looking at period inundation events. Um, it would change or reduce access to some rec uh, recreational infrastructure, such as tracks and campsite for local communities and, and visitors from the broader region. Um, it's potentially a, a bigger issue for people from the broader region because they don't know some of the alternative access ways in which you can get to particular camping areas and so forth. And your periodic inundation events uh, also have the potential to diversify some of the recreational activities uh, the parks can support. So with inundation events, uh, that could also support uh, kayaking and canoeing, which may attract other visitors uh, to these uh, parks to un undertake these kind of activities. And then importantly, the inundation events, we're looking at the potential for them to overlap with peak periods for park use. And this could result in uh, people who would ordinarily be camping in one area, moving to another area in the park. And that increases the use of these alternative areas. And we're looking at the intensification of the use of these alternative par areas in parks or in the, in the broader region. 
So moving on to uh, business, uh, there's a number of uh, observations we've been able to make in, in relation to uh, business and operations of the pro operation of the project. So one is the improved opportunities uh, for recreation based tourism businesses that would accrue for the project. Um, you've got indirect, oh, sorry, increased direct and indirect employment uh, that could also accrue from uh, the project and flow on impacts on uh, regional output. There is, however, the potential for a change in visitors during inundation uh, periods. Uh, particularly for parks with higher numbers of users, so that might be a change in the, the number, but also might be a change in the type of users because you have different activities attract different types of people. And then uh, also looking at the uh, effects on apris uh, farming or forestry businesses uh, uh, during uh, inundation periods. So they're just a few of the, in and, uh, the initial observations and I'll hand back to uh, Jane to move on to the next present part of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. Now for our last piece of work we'd like to talk to you about. Uh, we have Martin Smith, who's our Traffic and Transport Technical Lead. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Jane. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, as Jane says, I'm Martin Smith. I'm here to spend the next few minutes talking about the Traffic and Transport Assessment that we have undertaken uh, and are continuing to undertake uh, as part of the VMFRP programme. Uh, so what is a traffic and transport assessment? Uh, essentially, the uh, the work that we do considers the effects that this program will have upon the transport network. And by the, by the transport network, we include all arterial roads, that is state and major highways, uh, local roads and also tracks uh, within within parks and forests uh, that are part of this program. Um, our assessment looks at the effects that this project will have on uh, on motorists, on people using using these roads, but also on freight, which is a very significant component of, of traffic in this part of the world, uh, and also uh, other road users, public transport and, and pedestrian and cycle users as well. The main uh, focus of, of what we have looked at uh, in this study uh, has been around potential safety uh, impacts and, and effects that this project may have. That's during both construction and, and operation phases and, and what measures may be required to mitigate against any uh, safety concerns that have arisen as part of this project. Uh, and the, the, the second element is, is really around congestion and delay. And a couple of other presenters uh, today have, have touched on the, the potential impacts of, of localised speed restrictions and road, road closures uh, and, and things of that nature. Uh, in terms of the approach that we have taken, uh, it consists of of collecting traffic data. So we've 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 gone out and, and taken surveys of traffic volumes, uh, which is which is telling us what the existing demand on the road network is, uh, and that's broken down by vehicle type. So we can tell how many cars and how many trucks are using are using the road network. Uh, and we've also undertaken site visits to understand existing road conditions, the state that those roads are in uh, and how well they're operating. Uh, we've obtained crash data from the state government uh, and that looks that that tells us uh, any safety concerns, any any clusters themes uh, that, that are emerging on the network that we may need to be aware of and and potential opportunities to improve uh, upon any of those areas of concerns as a result of this project. Uh, and as as we always do, we looked at the uh, local policies, local and state policies and guidance relating to roads, access and operations to make sure that the work that we do meets all the requirements uh, of uh, of the authorities. <clears throat> Thank you. Next slide. Um, so during our um, during our, our site visits and our data collection uh, exercise, we we understood that there is a, a very wide variety and, of, and condition of, of road networks. Um, there are uh, lots of different conditions out there across across the extent of the program from very uh, high quality sealed uh, high speed roads uh, that you can see on, on the bottom of that page and also variable tracks which uh, have have variable conditions and may or may not be suitable for different types of uh, of different types of vehicles. Um, in terms of public transport, walking and cycling, that was observed, uh, as, as you all know, to be very, very low in these areas. Um, the assessment has told us so far that the arterial road network, which is the main highways, uh, carry a, a, a relatively high proportion of freight vehicles compared to uh, other highways across Victoria. 
as a percentage of total vehicles. Um, but in general, the road network operates well within its capacity. Uh, in all cases, low traffic volumes have been observed throughout the area uh, uh, without, without exception. All the roads operate well within what they are designed to carry. Um, and uh, the good news is the crash rates, the, the safety review that we've undertaken has told us that the, the crash rates within, uh, within the study areas are uh, at or below the average for Victoria as a whole, which is which is really good news and, and no no considerable uh, themes emerging in, in, in respect to safety. Uh, in terms of the effects that we anticipate this program to have, um, as has been mentioned a couple of times, the construction phase will involve the movement of quite a lot of large vehicles uh, carrying in, in, in and out of materials. Uh, and, and significant loads. They may be traveling quite slowly uh, and that might, might therefore hinder progress along particularly the arterial road network. There may be localized delays and there may be some, uh, con some conditional um, degradation on the, on the network that we need to, need to monitor and be aware of. Within study areas, some tracks may not be suitable for large vehicles and there might be localized upgrading or there will likely be localized upgrading such as resurfacing that's required to facilitate the movement of those vehicles. Uh, but this will have a permanent benefit, of course, to, to people wishing to access that area, making the area generally more accessible uh, for general use. Um, and there are opportunities for improvements to, to roads prone to water coverage as well. So this program will look at but how we can how we can make improvements uh, where we identify opportunities to do so. Uh, next slide, thank you. In terms of um, the observations that we've found, I guess, general conclusions that we've reached so far, um, the effects of the program uh, upon the traffic and transport network are very small, uh, other than some very localized and likely short term changes that will be required to facilitate the construction works that are required. Uh, public transport and active transport volumes are very low and the program uh, isn't anticipated to have any effect there. Um, but as mentioned, the, the program does offer opportunities to provide localized upgrades to road conditions, which will help to make the area easier to access in the future and, and, and hopefully make journeys that little bit more comfortable uh, and safer uh, in, the, uh, in the years ahead. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Well, that's our specialist investigations underway, and I just wanted to finish with the next steps if you would like to get involved in our project. Firstly, just a reminder of the robust process of the environmental effects statements that we are currently undertaking work for um, in, uh, in the lead up to public exhibition and ministerial consideration and assessment. In the meantime, we also have a range of activities for you to to be able to ask questions and find out about any updates in the lead up to the formal exhibition part of the process. Um, in particular, I would commend to you to sign up to our newsletter, uh, accordingly newsletter, the Floodplain Babbler via our engagement offices or our website. Also on our website, alongside this, alongside this final session on land use community and business will be our previous sessions in our technical presentation series on biodiversity, as well as surface water, geology and soils. And importantly, we have project team members who are keen to hear from you if there are any questions about what you've heard. They will get the right specialist or project manager to provide information and we'll have, you'll have opportunities to have your say. I'll leave it there and thank you for your interest and hope to hear from you soon. <laughs>